Good morning, church. Amen. It's been 14 years. Oh, you're smiling. Yes, I, I, I remember that. Thank you. The mask. Um, and guess what? It did get caught. It did get caught. Is it there? There we go. Um, it's been 14 years. God bless you. It's so good to be here. See some, some of old friends, old family. Uh, I have to give you greetings from Cecia. If not, I'll be in trouble. Um, she's still, she has this sickness. It's chronic. Um, it gets worse every day. It's called beauty. So I ask the Lord to continue giving her sickness as the time goes by. Um, Junior and Jared, Junior is 12, Jared is 10, and um, they haven't been here, but we hope to be back in November, if it's God's will, to be able to, to see our, our old family here at Lusaka Central. Thank you so much for welcoming me back. It's, it's a blessing to be here. And um, I also bring you greetings from 80 students that we have now in the School of Medicine. It's the second year that we've been opening now. Uh, we started out with a little over 30, and then last year more students came. We have a big group that's sponsored by the government. As you know, this is the seventh school that the church has, the seventh school. So we're, we're blessed to be part of this project and to be there. Um, I want to ask you to, to open your Bibles with me, and I'd like to start with two statements. The first one, is coming from Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 153, paragraph 4. Listen to it for a second. It says, those who have received instruction regarding the evils of the use of flesh foods, tea and coffee, and rich and unhealthy food preparations, and who are determined to make a covenant with God by sacrifice, will not continue to indulge their appetite for good that they know to be unhealthful. It continues and it says, God demands, it doesn't say God asks, God demands that the appetites be cleansed and that self-denial be practiced in regard to those things which are not good. It ends saying, this is a work that will have to be done before his people can stand before him in a perf in before him a perfected people not a mediocre people not a kind of people a perfected people amen i also like to read proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 it says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine but a broken spirit dieth the bones a merry heart, a happy mind, or a healthy mind does good like good medicine. It keeps you and me healthy. Let us bow our heads and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your mercies. Thank you for grace. Thank you for health. And thank you for allowing us to be together at this moment. We ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit and to allow us to learn new things and to remind us of those things we have learned in the past and to start putting them into practice according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, by the way, the hymn you sang is Cecilia's favorite hymn. Um, those, those, those are not coincidences. That's Holy Spirit guiding. Um, Dr. Arnold, that's my middle name. I mean, that's, that's got to be special somehow. Huh? Um, the, Lord has, the Lord has special things for us. Open your Bibles with me. And let's go to the book of Mark. And we'll start reading a little bit from chapter, from sharp, chapter 11, verse 15. This same incident is also found in Luke chapter 19, verses 45 and onward. We know that this is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He has just entered Jerusalem, and people are praising him. We know that Jesus wept as he enters the city because of the future that he sees in the city. 
He also weeps because they never really accepted him as a savior. We can speak of this for hours. Have we accepted him today? Does he continue to weep for you and for me? Do we really understand the real sense of his acceptance? Do we really accept Jesus? He goes to the temple and finds it closed. Remember the story. He finds it closed. We can talk about that for hours. What do we do in our churches during the week? I, I found that some churches in Mexico, Colombia, are opening their church during the week as a lifestyle center. Interesting, lifestyle center, nutrition classes, correct amount of food according to what we have in the area, what's really needed to keep us healthy, exercise for different ages, and, uh, and talks about these things. Interesting, during the week, teaching classes for the community and to the brethren, using the Sabbath school classrooms that they have as the anchors for all these conversations. What do we do with our main hall? Or are we only using it on Sabbath? Do we, do we minister, do we evangelize throughout the week with it? Just a thought. Mark chapter 11, verse 13, it says, And seeing a fig tree afar of having leaves, he came. If happily, he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Notice that he goes happily to see the tree. Notice that he thinks it looks good, but only as an appearance. Do some people just look like they're well with God? Do I give only an impression of my inner self to other people just by looking at me? What about looking at you? Do we try to fool God with the appearance? Do we try to fool God with our own habits, the things we do on a daily basis? Who am I fooling? Who are you fooling? Notice as well that this is not the right season, but Jesus was expecting fruit. He looks at the tree, he looks at the church, but he wants to see fruit. He wants to see you and me. He wants to enjoy his time with you and me during these hours. But he does not find fruit. He does not find you. He does not find me. He sees the church empty. And I wonder why. He sees the fig tree, curses the tree for having no fruit, according to verse 14. He approached the, sea, the tree to see the fruit. He approaches you and me. He inspects you. He inspects me. Stand before me, he says, just like he told Abraham many years before. Yesterday, I was driving back from Usakai Hospital, and I saw the Jacaranda um, branch, which is now a church. It is one of Central's fruits. Uh, and how many others are out there? How many of us are involved in cultivating these trees called Lusaka Central branches? So many more fruits can come, and many more after that. The population in Lusaka is growing. What is it, 2.6 now, 2.5? Are we growing with it? We're about um, 1.2. In, in Lusaka, and I wonder if we're growing there as well as the church continues to grow. Mark 11 verse 15 reads and it says, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Verse 16 continues and it says, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He returns the following day to the temple and begins to cast out merchants, sellers, and buyers. Verse 16 is quite interesting. It says, would not suffer any man should carry any vessel through the temple. I like Mark. Mark, in the Apostle Mark, he, he, he notices that this is a little bit different. The word he uses is hirion, meaning courts, not meaning temple, 
but meaning what's around the temple, the area that's beyond the temple. I like to imagine these places, places where to go and meditate and pray. We should have some of these sometimes. Um, you go to, to Andrews University, they have that prayer area right next to the church. You go to our university in the Philippines, Ayas, they have a garden of prayer. And people go there, not only on Sabbath, but during the week, early hours of the morning, late hours at night, just to sit down and meditate and pray. As we plan what we're doing to the church, as we continue modifying what we're doing to the area, we need to think of areas, gardens of prayer, places where we can come and sit with God, where we can sit and meditate and understand a little bit more of what he wants for us. This story that is also found in Matthew chapter 21, and just switch there with me, we'll go to verse 12. It says, and Jesus went into the temple of God. It does not just say temple, it says temple of God. And cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables and the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Jesus now enters the temple, and notice that Matthew is the only one that gives a family name to that temple. This is Lusaka Central Church, huh? Temple of God. We can stay on that for the rest of the hour. Who owns you? This body you have, is it yours? Do you do as you please in it? Remember, it's borrowed. How are you treating it? You see, by giving a name to that temple, the Lord was claiming ownership lordship to that temple as a father god is a god of love and as children he takes care of us but don't forget that god is not only our father he's also our lord so he demands commands certain things from us his servants so who owns you who owns me Jesus cast out all that sold and bought in his temple. Jesus assumes that authority in his life, in my life, in that church's life, and shuns merchants away. Like when you see a snake and you turn around the other way, you don't just stay looking at it, you run. You run from it. No room for negotiation. No discussion to know if, if it's V-shape, U-shape of the head. You just smash it on the head or run. No, no need to see if this is poisonous or not. Jesus just shuns the merchants away. He just cast out the problem. Jesus kicks it out of the church and out of the premises that are around. Jesus assumes the, the authority in my life. Has he done it in yours? Have you allowed him to? Does he need to shun some merchants from your life? What merchants do you have? Pornography? The TV set? Some people will say the spouse? And those are some obvious ones. What about the ones that we don't see? What about coffee? Drugs? Meat? Black tea? Are you shunning those things away from your life? Have we made, these, made ourselves dependent on these things to be able to continue and to go throughout life? You see, I, I see nobody smiling anymore. Uh, you were smiling at the beginning and now it stops through the eyes we can see smiles. Um, when will we make the decision to do what is right before God's eyes? When will we make that decision? When, what, what are the precincts of your temple that the Lord needs to clean up and shun these merchants away? Remember, this is not the temple yet. This is what's going on outside of the temple. This is the courtyard. 
What are you holding that eliminates your time with Jesus? He cannot enter and have a good conversation with me, with you, because we have so many other things that detract him from coming in, from us being to pay attention to him. Is it work? Is it too much of it? Does Jesus need to change our jobs? Are we having issues with observing the Sabbath in full? You know, we leave right now, and from here on, we go straight to the office. Sunset on Friday evening, do we still observe it? From sunset Friday evening to sunset Saturday evening? Are we still doing this as a church? What about money? Is money the issue? Do we give our tithes and offerings? Is this what's preventing us from being able to have that conversation with Jesus? The church does not manage it well, so we stop giving our offerings to church. Uh, so I prefer handling it myself. I give it to other people that need it more. Does Jesus need to come and remove those thoughts from our system, from our life? How can I recognize these problems I'm having in my life, Lord, I wonder? How can you show me these merchants that are around my building that are interfering with your entrance? I hope you can spend some time to pray. And when he shows you what it is that is not allowing him to enter, that you can shun those things away. Remove those things. Remove those things, Lord, we ask. And you know, the Lord didn't do this gently. He removed it with force. It was not a slow removal, no. He did it with power. No mistakes about what he was intending to do. Sometimes we do not know what we have and these merchants that we have that only Jesus should have. But guess what? He can also shun those things away. Amen. Jesus demonstrates that he has that power even today. We need Jesus to protect our minds, our families, our church. We have a part to do in all of this, spending time in our own worship, praying, learning hymns, learning new verses by heart. There's a reason why our connection with God on a daily basis is so important. Um, this morning at the, at the Sabbath school, uh, they were mentioning how this has to be not only on a daily basis, but on a constant basis, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We cannot defend ourselves against the enemy on our own. Remember Psalms 91, how we need the protection from God? Remember Psalms 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't say, for I am with me. It says, you are with me. Uh, remember 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. It says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me until his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Preserve me. Preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Back to Matthew 21, verse 13. It says, And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Verse 13, he calls it his, his house. He's calling this his house, this body we have, his house. Jesus overthrew all things. Jesus can overthrow all things that cause problems in your life. He has that power, and it's only in his name. That's what Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells him. Peter reminds us of that. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men where must we, we can be saved. Any sin you have, he has the power. Any struggle you have, he has the power. Only in Jesus' name can this work, can this come out. Any addiction we have has only Jesus the power to get it out of our lives. Have you allowed him to come into your life? Have you allowed him to see and to clean up all these precincts we have? The, the question is, do we even want to get rid of these things? Do we enjoy them so much that we're not willing to get rid of them? 
Matthew 21, 13, again, and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. This time, Matthew uses a different word. The word is naos, and it does mean temple here. Jesus cannot dwell if there's things around you. And this is where the health system, the health message for the church really begins. Jesus cannot dwell in our hearts if there's things that are taking that space. I hope you're hearing me. Jesus cannot dwell in my life if there are things that are taking his space. Sam, we mentioned this morning, we mentioned it this morning, you should have been in our Sabbath school, you would have heard the sermon and then you wouldn't have to come. Uh, and it wasn't me preaching, it was the Holy Spirit guiding, Holy Spirit guiding people that are there. My will belongs to God, what I want belongs to God, but if God is not there, who is? Who's taking that space? There are things that hinder his dwelling. What would you be willing to give up for Jesus? For us to look good. That is the world. That is world fashion. Uh, be a vegetarian so you can slim down and look nice. Um, to stop uh, killing animals so that the world can have um, better good air to live. Uh, and I can have, find you several articles with all these things and good data that proves this. Uh, but that's not the reason why he's looking for us to be healthy. Uh, several articles that you also find, for example, Dr. Selhub, she talks about nutritional psychiatry. She says, what you eat directly affects the structure and function of your brain and ultimately your mood. Interesting article. Dr. Alice Goomstein, she says that nutrition plays a key role, not only in physical health, but directly affects our emotional well-being. Dr. Koda, a psychiatrist, she writes and she asks the question, why wouldn't we think eating well will also impact our mental health? Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of days, verse 2 says, and long life and peace shall they add to thee. It doesn't only talk about your physical health, but also about your mental health. God says, keep my commandments. Let your mind keep my commandments. How can we keep the word without having a solid mind, having a stable mind? And it comes with a promise of living longer. You see, friends, God needs my health. God needs my good health in order for him to dwell in me. God cannot be in touch with sin. So God does not dwell in sin. Remember his promise to Solomon. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, he says, If my people, which are called by my name, this is not called by the devil's name, children of God, called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. You, you, you talked to us this morning about being like John the Baptist, and trust me, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for the church. You promised that you would be praying for us. Um, I'm going to be praying for this. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear them from heaven. He needs it. He needs my health to transmit his purposes in my mind and for me to understand them better. There's no other reason. There's no other reason. Better reasoning, easier way to obey his call. Easier to see my current state, my sinful state. Easier to accept my need for him. Easier to communicate with him. Easier for me to have his image 
easier for me to be according to his likeness, image of uncorruptibleness, likeness of holiness. How will I ever reach to that state? I, I say the Holy Spirit is guiding because I, I also wrote down Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through verse 23. Um, Genesis 1, 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. He wants to communicate. He wants us to transmit that. Amen. Romans 1, 21 through 23, which we read in the morning, again, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart, their mind, was darkened. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And verse 23, and changed the glory, the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. And you mentioned it already this morning. And to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. In communicating with God is what all this struggle is all about. Then what are you and I doing about it? What will it take? What would you give up? What would you start doing? Would you consume the same things you're having today? Would your lifestyle continue the same? Knowing that it does not allow him to dwell in your nails, in your temple. Are we going to continue our lives the way we've been doing it up until today? What will it take? The Commonwealth Games are going on these days, as you know. Um, we have, what's his name? Um, Musala, is that his name? Musala? The, the, the Zambian athlete that runs that one. <laughs> huh? And um, you remember when he won earlier in the year, when he won the 400 meters, and he was excited, and he'd say, it's been paid off in one moment. That's all I needed. He got the gold, right, some, some months back. Um, this gold means everything. My hardships on giving up anything is all translated in this medal. And us, what hardships are we going through to achieve excellence in our relationship with God? What to give up to start? Let me ask you a question. What does your pantry look like? Your, that closet inside your house where you keep your food? What does it look like? What do you have in there? You know, um, back to verse 13, Jesus, when he says the temple where he dwells, compares his dwelling to the other's dwelling. He says it's a den, a derogatory place to live, not a house, not a home, a place where thieves live, he says where animals, not humans, live. He says our living conditions are not what they're supposed to be. Sacred things made common. Do we understand that our bodies are sacred? They've been separated for a cause. Not to be defiled is what the Bible uses. We rob God. We steal him. Others that see the way we behave do not get to know God. Others see our health and wonder, are these truly God's people? Do they really have this image and likeness of God as is described in Genesis 1, verse 26, verse 27? Matthew 21, verse 14 continues and it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Verse 14, Jesus restores those prisons. He restores that temple, and he heals people. The temple now becomes the reason for its original purpose. It does not just remain for merchants, but for people to come and have a closer relationship with God. He starts using it not just for praying, 
but from doing community service. He starts answering the prayers of the people that would come with sickness and disease. Once you clean your house, Jesus can now come and dwell. Amen. Now he can come and communicate with you and me. You will be a different person, your image in the likeness of Jesus. Matthew 21 verse 15 says, And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were so displeased. They were displeased. Right now we have a struggle in our minds. Um, listen to Eustace talking right now. Listen to what he's calling us out to do. He does not look so healthy right now to us. Um, you know the spirit of prophecy. It, it mentions that while the preacher is preparing the notes, the enemy is also looking to see how, distract, how to distract our minds, how to move our thoughts away. Will we remain the same? The week is starting. Will we remain the same? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to come and dwell? So that image and likeness can come back to what God is looking for. You know, um, a similar incident is also found in John chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. This one now is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he says there, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. This is why we read Psalms 93, verse 5. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness become thine house, O Lord, forever. This we will achieve when we reach heaven. But the process needs to start now. Amen. Holiness become thy house. Our bodies become his dwelling. Sacred, set apart. Holy Spirit seeks for his presence in our homes, our lives, our families, our church. And not only for the Sabbath, but throughout the week. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Prophecy shares that when we have our worship in the morning with our children, it takes the, the, the angels follow our children throughout the day. It follows them throughout the What are we doing at home? Translate this. Translate this to your own house. And put your names there. Thy testimonies are very true. Holiness becomes the Pentecost house. O oh Lord, forever. What are you doing? What am I doing? Psalm 69 verse 9 says, For the seal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. For the zeal of thine house. What house is Jesus talking about here? Why such envy, jealousy, shown from Jesus to the house, to the temple? Who designed this temple in the first place? Who decided, designed this temple to be in his image and his likeness? You see why he has that zeal? You understand why the Lord is so jealous of us and our bodies? And then comes Paul with those famous words, Romans 14, verses 7 through 8. He says, For none of us liveth, liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Verse 8, but whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live thereof or die, we are whose? We're the Lord's. We're the Lord's. This is not our body. This does not belong to us. We don't even live for ourselves. Not even the life I have is mine. It belongs to God. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, once you have recognized this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but who? Christ. That lives where? In, in me. In me. We don't live for ourselves. Romans chapter 14, verse 12, Paul saying, so then every one of us shall give accounts to himself, of himself, to God. We account for our lives, for our body, our health to God. We're accountable, responsible to God. 
parents were accountable for our children's lives, for their body and for their health. Parents, teachers, as you're doing the classes when you're in school, professionals, those people that are around you, anyone, children, those kids that are beside you, we're accountable to God. We're accountable for the way that we treat and how we teach other people about the same. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 12 says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Not all things are appropriate. Health terms, not all things are good for my body. Some people translate this, world, uh, this word as helpful for my body. Although it might taste good, it might not be good for me. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, What you know, what know ye, not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, not of yourselves, and you're not your own, it says. Our bodies are dwelling places. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either Jesus dwells in you, or you know the rest of the phrase. Can you imagine what this would be like? Have you experienced the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Can you imagine? The following verse says, mentions that we're bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. We do not belong to ourselves. We've been purchased. Therefore, glorify God in your body. How do you glorify God in your body? How do you make sure you're communicating with God? 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If any man, any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which, is, which temple ye are. He's warning us again against not keeping or defiling this temple. Remember Jesus, how he destroyed the, all, everything of those merchants and what they were doing? Jesus makes this pretty serious. He doesn't hold this as something very shy. Verse 12, again in Matthew 21, says, And Jesus went into the temple of God, cast them all out and th that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables and the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. As Christians, we believe in the Bible. We believe in creation. We believe in the great controversy. We believe in baptism, the gift of prophecy. We, as Adventists, we believe in Sabbath. Uh, we even believe in the second coming. That's part of our name, right? Advent. Amen. We believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Christ took care of the whole person, the whole thing. And even in our 28 beliefs, uh, belief number 22 talks about our Christian behavior. And it doesn't say behave good. It says being like Jesus. Amen. Being like Jesus. And it talks about in our walk, in our appearance, in our thoughts, in what we consume. And as a church, we tend to have days and weeks such as these. And sometimes we bring out some very good studies and we talk about the disadvantages of, of not being vegetarian, and then we have the, the, the conversations like the ones we have in the afternoon, where we have questions and answers, and then we say, yes, we will all give up this, give up that, and the day passes, and then we'll say, yes, I'll start doing it tomorrow because what I prepared for today is too good for lunch. And, um, and, and, and we continue in that trend. We continue in that trend in our lives. And we read strong quotes um, from Ellen G. White. And, and that's the way we say, and we say, you know what? We eat meat, you're going to hell. And um, we, 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 we use strong phrases. We use strong observations. But if the question is, how are you going to communicate better with God? 
so that you can reflect his image. What are you willing to start doing from now on? Amen. He wants to communicate this. You know, Daniel proves this. Dan Daniel in chapter 10, even chapter 9, but Daniel in chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three, four weeks. Remember that. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Daniel, Daniel. Daniel was mourning, praying for God to intervene. In these moments of trouble, when, when he needed God the most, he, he took certain things away from his life. You remember that story? That's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Why did he stop consuming these things? I know it mentions there something about wine, and that's for a different conversation. But you see what it says in verse 1. He needed understanding. He needed understanding. He needed communication with God. I would like to challenge you today to look at the pantry of your life. What things are not allowing Jesus to come in? Why is he not able to have full authority of your life? What, what's, what's in the precincts? What's dwelling inside? What, what's happening? What will you do? Will you remain in that state forever? Will I remain in that state forever? Describe your house. Think about it. Take a couple minutes of it. You, you go inside, the living room is there. What's, what's in the center of the living room? Is it the TV? Is it the Bible? What, what's happening in our homes? What are we keeping there? Matthew chapter 20, verses 32 to 34. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? What do you want me to do for you? They said unto him, Lord, rather that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Let our eyes be open, Lord. Let our eyes be open. Jesus, we need understanding. Remember Solomon? How when God asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And all he says is, give me wisdom, give me understanding, so I may know how to deal with thy people. What, what, what do we want? What do you really need? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the end, until the day of Jesus Christ. If we ask, he will give, he will give it to us. Then we'll be like Zechariah chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. You know how it happened then? When, when it says that people were coming and they were grabbing on the, on the clothes of the Israelites because they would see how blessed they were. You remember those verses? Um, it says... And, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go there speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Verse 22, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, in Lusaka Central, and to pray before the Lord. Verse 23, Thus said the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nation, even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. We, we need that. We need that. I don't know how many of you are, are willing to put yourselves in a dwelling place, as a dwelling place for God. Would you raise your hands? Would you raise your hands? Would you, would you be, be challenged enough to stand where you are and commit yourselves to doing what is right? Don't stand if you're not planning to. And don't worry, there's no shame. 
But if you're willing to commit yourselves to be a receiving, a dwelling place for the Lord, do stand. And as this week starts, and as we continue having our health presentations, keep that in the back of your mind. Health is for a reason. We need to communicate better with God. Reflect his image for his glory and honor. God bless you. In closing, in closing we'll sing hymn number 469, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Four six nine. we want to lean on Jesus Amen. we want to have our lives clean <laughs> clean everything that's around it Lord even things that we cannot see come and dwell in us and allow us to be able to understand you listen to you and practice what you command in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. Yeah.